And we talked to my friend, Andy McCarthy. He joins us via phone, and he is obviously a best-selling author, and you know him too, former chief assistant U.S. attorney. He's seen on Fox as well. Andy, always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, thanks for your time today. Tell me about this, because it, it looked like, or at least the way that it was presented to you know all of us out here watching on the sidelines who don't have all of the detailed knowledge of everything that's happening, they really wanted to present this as a slam dunk as it related to Giuliani, but you're saying... Saying that this actually is going to spa- this is going to backfire on the DOJ. Oh yeah, Dane. I think uh, it could backfire big time because what they're doing here, and this is this is decades of Biden. We should know he just doesn't know how to leave well enough alone. In fact, the whole reason this even happened, I think, uh, is and this doesn't excuse some of the people Rudy was working with, obviously, but. Um, This all happened because Biden, being Biden, claimed that he had gotten the Ukrainian uh, prosecutor fired when he didn't. I mean, he he was one of a cast of thousands of people who were trying to lean on Ukraine uh, to be serious about anti-corruption. But his story doesn't line up. He didn't, you know, this whole big deal about how, you know, he told him I'm leaving in six hours. And if you don't fire the prosecutor by then, uh, you're not getting your trillion or your billion dollars. That never happened. Um, It was months later when the prosecutor was removed actually by parliament. Um, It didn't happen the way that he said it happened, but it was, he was once again, you know, trying to make himself into a bigger deal than he was. But the result of it was, and he probably didn't realize this, he made it, he he laid the story out in a way that was susceptible of an interpretation that he was trying to remove a guy because his son was on the board at the company, even though the son was not implicated in what the company was being investigated for. Uh, so the whole thing is caused by Biden being a blowhard, which, you know, <laughs> after a half century, that's big news. Right. Um, but the thing is, a guy who was smart and knew how to leave well enough alone would declare victory now and move on. Right. Because what happened here is the guys that Giuliani was dealing with in Ukraine were sanctioned by the Trump administration for peddling Russian disinformation. So Biden has the ability here to say basically he's been vindicated, that all the Trump campaign claims that he was involved in some kind of criminal corruption in Ukraine uh, have not only been disproved, but the guys Giuliani was dealing with were, you know, Russian moles. And you you leave it at that and you call it a day. Instead, what they're doing is they have the Justice Department pursuing Rudy in a criminal case. And the criminal, the pretext for the criminal case is the um, FARA, the Foreign Agents right. Registration, right. which to Mueller, in the half century prior to Mueller, the Justice Department brought exactly seven FARA cases, only three of which were successful prosecutions. The Justice Department doesn't consider this to be a serious crime. Their position has always been to try to get people who are working on behalf of foreign governments to get right with the law and register with the Justice Department, not to treat what they're doing as a serious felony violation. Right. Mueller pulled this out pretextually to have a kind of a criminal patina to the investigation he was doing on uh, Trump and the campaign. I guess the FBI did it before uh, Mueller did it. Right. But Nobody in the Mueller investigation actually got convicted, not even Manafort got convicted of being a foreign agent of Moscow, of Russia. Nobody did. So the whole thing was just a farce. And here they are again using this to, as a pretext to investigate Giuliani and not only to investigate him, but they go to his house and his office and also Victoria Tunzing's house. And they get a search warrant. Yeah. And they basically rifle through the guy's uh, stuff, including his communications devices, which is a gross constitutional violation of the 
the attorney-client rights of the clients of these lawyers. And that was, and, and not to interrupt you, but that was one of the concerns that I had because he's involved in a case with the government and the government <laughs> sends people to come and confiscate his, 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 his uh, computers and hard drives on which there is that I- information that's protected by, by uh, client attorney privilege. That, that, that seems really just beyond. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's really beyond the pale, especially in this case. Let me tell you what they always say. This comes up from time to time. It's not unconstitutional. I know Alan Dershowitz has been out there saying it's unconstitutional. <laughs> I agree with most of his right. critique. But on this particular, I think he's wrong. It's not unconstitutional to search a lawyer's stuff, whether it's his uh, his home, his premises, his office or what. I did mafia cases when I was a prosecutor. And the game is like sometimes when you're dealing with organized crime guys, what they'll do is they'll insinuate a lawyer into their communications. So when they give criminal directions, they have they have a way to say later, well, you can't use that. Mm -hmm. We had my lawyer there. It's all privileged. So it's a game and you can't let that go on. So if there's a really serious crime and the only way that you can get the evidence is is to search the lawyer, you're allowed to search the lawyer. But the Justice Department frowns on it because you can't search the lawyer without violating the Sixth Amendment constitutional attorney client rights of other people who go to the lawyer. And what the way this always gets litigated, the Justice Department says, oh, don't worry about it because we'll have a tape team. You see, what happens is before we show the communications to the team that's doing the investigation, we have another team of prosecutors who goes through them first to make sure that the investigative team only sees what's relevant. Right. Well, that, that's perfectly fine protection for the lawyer who's on who, who's in the investigation and and for anyone else who's involved in that investigation. But let's say you went to Victoria Tunsing because you had a, com- a, a legal problem that was completely unrelated to Russia, Ukraine, Giuliani or any of that stuff. How does it help you that one set of prosecutors versus another set of prosecutors got to look at your client communications, your privileged information from your discussions with Victoria? That right. doesn't help you, not in any way, right? right? So the thing is, this is like a it, when the Justice Department is working the way it's supposed to work, this is the kind of thing you only do in a really serious case that involves stuff like murder where you need the lawyer's information to prove a really serious crime. You don't do it to prove something that you've pr- that you've charged seven times in 60 years. Yeah, that doesn't And that isn't sense. treated as a crime. Yeah, that doesn't it, it makes it it makes zero sense and and I you know hearing you explain it we're talking to my friend Andy McCarthy. Uh, it, I don't I, I don't see how this doesn't how did this doesn't burn them why we have uh, time with you Andy I want to ask you really quickly as well uh, because it was announced today those other uh, the indictment of those uh, other officers that were involved in Minneapolis and uh, George Floyd's death the charges as I understand them they're they're looking at aid that was denied Floyd tell me a little bit about this I mean I can't imagine them not getting a conviction on this particularly when looking at the Chauvin case I mean there was sef- definitely some of the charges I thought was going to be a slam dunk by prosecution others I thought maybe they had a little bit more of a hill to climb but this one I, it seems like that 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 conviction is just that we're almost at like this is a formality obvious at this point that they that they'll probably be found guilty well I don't know but I, I think it does go to your point. Uh, about how politicized prosecutions are back Mm. because, you know, number one, this is a much more difficult federal case than the state case because in the state you have to prove murder. Right. In the federal case, you have to prove that they knowingly and willfully violated somebody's constitutional rights. In other words, under circumstances where the police called for an ambulance for Floyd and then held him, they not only used excessive force, but they had it in their minds to violate his constitutional rights, Mm. which who knows if they were even thinking about his constitutional rights. So these kind of cases, because it's a willfulness standard and the only reason for federal intervention is because it's a violation of a federal constitutional right. 
they're uphill even when the evidence looks like it's slam donkey like it wow. like it does state case right but the other thing i would point out is um the justice department could have gotten this indictment and sealed it and instead they've publicized it now right before chauvin's supposed to get sentenced and right before the other three cops are supposed to be or ex-cops are supposed to be tried tried in august so they are intentionally inflaming the sentencing judge and poisoning the jury pool for the next trial. Again. There's no reason for them to do this. There's no sta- statute of limitations problem. They could have just done what you usually do, which is seal it and wait until all the state stuff was over by the end of the year. And then you unseal it and decide whether to go forward or not. So, I, you know, I, again, wow. I think this is more signaling to their – uh, to their political base than it is something that has a good law enforcement purpose. I mean, this guy Chauvin's going to get close to 40 years in jail. How much more are they going to do by exactly. prosecuting him? Yeah, exactly. And if he gets acquitted, it'll undermine everything that's happened up until now. And and to your point as well, when you say that they have even, because it's a federal, not a state case, uh, and, and, and thank you for that clarification too, that it's going to even when the evidence looks great, it's going to be uphill for them. I mean, maybe this is the, I mean, it looks like this is them acknowledging that and then trying to kind of tip the scales in their favor by not sealing this indictment. Wow. Yeah. Political prosecutions, indeed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dana, I had a case one time against um, drug dealers who uh, tried to hold up a cop. And it, it was a terrible case. They shot the guy. He couldn't identify him. It was a terrible case. Uh, he had gotten quitted in the Bronx, and then they brought the case to us because it's dual sovereignty. State prosecution doesn't give you double jeopardy protection from a later federal prosecution. So we could bring a federal prosecution on attempted murder, but we had to show that it was an attempted murder that affected interstate commerce. And the jury ended up hanging because that's the, you have to have a federal nexus. It can't just right. be just a federal prosecution on the same right. uh, you know, charges as the state. So when we got to talk to the jury after they hung, they, one of the things they said to me was, why are we talking about interstate commerce? What does that have to do with, with you know, a police officer during a drug buy got shot in the back? What does that have to do with interstate commerce? Like, why do you – what does that have to do with anything? So these are much harder cases than people realize they are at the federal level. Yeah, very much so. Good heavens. Andy McCarthy, our friend, we, we so appreciate talking with you and you breaking these issues down for us. I hope you have a great weekend, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to speak with you and hope to talk with you again soon. You too, Dana. Thanks. Of course. Take care.